I am just being told we have a pick, and it's Kamala Harris of California. Uh, just told in my ear at this second. For the record, those applause were from Claire McCaskill. Kamala <laughs> Harris is the... The breaking news, Biden has selected the California senator as his <clears throat> running mate. Who do we have up? Mike Memoli, Wilmington. Well, what was I just saying, Brian? The, the obvious have. choice to a lot of folks before this process is indeed the final choice for the former vice president. It is California Senator Kamala Harris. I think a number of factors to take into consideration. One is when we've seen vice presidential uh, when we've seen a vice presidential choice that has been a surprise what has been a common theme it has been somebody who needed to shake up the race i uh, think sarah palin being chosen by john mccain in 2008 think uh geraldine Fer ferraro by walter mondale in 1984. this of course is a campaign that is feeling very much uh, confident in its current standing in the polls aware of course that when you're running against donald trump Things can change in a hurry. But what has been, of course, number one rule in the vice presidential search process is do no harm. And this seems to be, by, by the account of, I think, a lot of Democrats who have been close to this process, with the advice that Joe Biden has been getting. Now, we've talked about a virtual announcement, a digital announcement. I will read to you uh, briefly from the email that has just shown up in our inbox. Biden beginning by explaining what he thought he needed in a running mate. He said, these are not normal times. I need somebody working alongside me who is smart, tough, and ready to lead. Kamala is that person. Uh, typically, of course, we, it's not a surprise to see a, a candidate chosen as Joe Biden was in 2008, uh, who, who served and was part of the presidential race as well. We know that Eric Garcetti, a member of that four-person search committee, recently said that everyone passed the vet. But it certainly there's, a, I think, a degree of comfort on a lot of people's part that Kamala Harris herself was part of this presidential race. She was vetted during the course of that. And in, let's not forget, she was vetted in the course of a career in California politics, not beanball by any means. She was elected statewide twice uh, as the attorney general and then as a U.S. senator in 2016. And so for a campaign that is eager to continue the message, focus squarely on what Joe Biden has said since day one is about a battle for the soul of America. Clearly, Biden making that decision that the partner he wants alongside in fighting that battle is somebody who he has seen uh, on the campaign trail and it's sometimes directed at him willing to fight. Uh, and that is Kamala Harris, Brian. Uh, Mike Memoli, thank you. Claire McCaskill standing by. Claire, your applause were noted on live television. Talk about your former fellow senator. Well, she's going to be a terrific vice president. Um, I had the opportunity to, to watch Kamala as she came into the Senate. She was on the committee that I was a ranking member of, Homeland Security, Government Affairs. I watched her as she questioned people like General Kelly, over immigration policy. And this is not somebody who uh, is anybody's fool. She was prepared. She was intelligent in terms of the kinds of questions she asked. And most important, she didn't let up. Uh, she is um, aggressive, and I mean that in all positive ways, in terms of fighting for the things that I think this ticket um, is going to be fighting for. And I just think she's a terrific pick. I think she'll be a loyal and hardworking candidate. She has been under the Klieg lights, Brian. I mean, you, and, and, you know, and remember, y y her election in 2010 was close. I mean, she's been in tough elections, not just, I think we think of people running in California as never having a tough election, but, you know, the primary, the system of getting elected out there is very mano a mano, and it was not a done deal when she ran for attorney general and won. And obviously a lot of competition uh, to step into Barbara Boxer's seat when she won the election um, to, to the Senate. So uh, this is somebody who has been toughened by her career. Her career shows that she has what it takes when the pressure is on. And I think she's going to be a great uh, vice president and, and a particularly strong candidate. Uh, I look forward to the debate against Mike Pence. 
Uh -huh. To that end, Reverend Al Sharpton is among those uh, waiting to react to this live news with us. Uh, uh, Rev, uh, we should quickly point out what the senator was just alluding to. Kamala Harris has drawn blood in nationally televised hearings uh, of members of this administration um, and uh, has been an aggressive questioner given her legal background. She's been aggressive in terms of her legal background uh, as a prosecutor in questioning people that came before a committee in the Senate. But she's shown herself to be a very good debater. Uh, I went to just about all of the Democratic primary debates this year. And as one that was in them myself, I would always talk to her after. She would say, or her sister Maya would say to me, how do you think she did? She will give Vice President uh, Pence a very, very, very uh, bad evening on that debate because she's a great debater. She knows what she's about. I think Joe Biden could have chosen someone else, but he couldn't have chosen anyone better. She is clearly a great campaigner, but she's also good at governing. She ran uh, that uh, a judicial system there in California and was a great advocate in the Senate. I've known her uh, for probably 12, 15 years, and I can tell you she's tough, she's thorough, and she's ready. I talked to her just a few days ago. She had no idea where it was going, but she was willing to go wherever it would lead, whether she was a supporter or whether she was the vice presidential nominee. Now that she is the nominee, I don't think that you could have a tough opponent. I know that the Trump people are preparing all they can to throw at her, but you cannot have a better person to throw it at that it will bounce off her like it didn't mean anything because she's been in tough fights before. So if I was Donald Trump, and uh, Mr. Pence, I'd be ready for a real battle now. Rev, we're seeing some of the pictures from the day I was about to reference. Absent ideology or party or bias or any of that, as a sheer campaign event, as, a, uh, as an event that required advance work and stagecraft, her announcement in Oakland was one of the stunners of this cycle and as someone referenced earlier campaign didn't work out so well but that was a truly exciting event on a beautiful day in california Twenty thousand people of all races uh, of all uh, generations it was intergenerational it was one of the most memorable events of the 2020 primary season to see those amount of people standing there it, it, it made her candidacy uh, because it really, without even the speech, which was a great speech that day, it gave her message. And that's the kind of woman that's going to be hitting the trail that can draw people intergenerational, interracial, and relate to them. The one thing that is good about Kamala Harris is that usually when you meet people that's been in politics or criminal justice long, they don't have the ability to connect. She seems to have the ability to make people feel like she can relate to them. She's listening to them. She's had the experience. She grew up with her sister, with a single mother at a period. She understands all sides of America. And that's who you want sitting next to the president of the United States to try to undo an administration that many of Americans perceive to be not understanding their plight, not understanding that they went through. No one feels that Donald Trump or Mike Pence has lived the average life. Kamala Harris has lived that life. So has Joe Biden. And I think they're being able to relate is going to be the hidden weapon in this kind of race we're going to see in November. And the more you attack them from the Trump side, the more they're going to show that public that that's the kind of people that keep uh, uh, that can get uh, licking and keep ticking because that's what all of us have had to do in life. And we've certainly had to do it through this pandemic. Rev Al Sharpton, thank you. Uh, as always, Joy Reid, whose shift begins, I guess, in a short 90 minutes from now. Uh, also joining us, Joy, you heard uh, Reverend Al say this is probably the best choice Joe Biden could have made. Do you concur? I, I absolutely concur. And one thing that Reverend Al left off is that when he was a young man, he was the New York youth organizer for a woman named Shirley Chisholm. 
And Kamala Harris, when she launched her presidential campaign that you referenced, Brian, a little earlier, she rooted her run in Shirley Chisholm, in the legacy of Shirley Chisholm. And I have to tell you that for Joe Biden to choose her, to choose to embrace that legacy at a time when African Americans are questioning whether or not our counterparts in other parts of this country will fully accept our citizenship is the greatest affirmation to the power of black women, to the tenacity of black women, to the legacy of black women as carrying the Democratic Party uh, on our backs for generations. It's a legacy that Shirley Chisholm began in 1972. And for Joe Biden to make this choice and to make it after all the backbiting that we heard that, oh, my God, she challenged him on race. He showed himself to be a big man, a big enough man to say that I want the person that challenges me. I want the person that forces me to be better. I want the person that questions me on matters of race because that's why she's there. I want the woman that people say is too ambitious, wants to be uh, too powerful, has a future. I want that, to embrace that. I'm proud of Joe Biden, I have to say, as a man of his generation, to be the anti-Trump today to be the anti-Trump and to affirm black women in this way, on this day, with the president that's in there now, this could not be a better selection. He's taken us back to the start. She was always the most logical choice. He did a lot of searching. He did a lot of research, and he came right back to where he really should have always been. I think this is a great day for this country. Joy, is there anyone whose reaction you're curious about or waiting to hear as uh, as we go on into the evening? Anyone who you're worried about embracing this choice? I'm not worried because I'll tell you, black women that I spoke with, after the conclusion of the primary, there was a sense of non-buyer's remorse specifically about Kamala Harris. I can't tell you, Brian, how many black women said to me, you know what, looking back on it, I wish that I'd gotten information for her. You know what, looking at it, the fact that in the end, mainly black people said, you know what, let's choose this white guy, right, this older white guy, said, darn it, we missed an opportunity. And I think there's so many black women, her, you know, the sororities, the, you know, the organizations that all literally could have really gotten information for her. I heard a lot of non-buyers remorse. And so I think that black women in particular, that women in general are ready to get information for this woman. I, the, the reaction that I really do want to hear, though, and that I am really excited to hear is going to be Barack Obama and Michelle Obama, because they open that door in a way that can never be closed. And the fact that that door stayed open for Kamala Harris, who at one point Barack Obama said was the most impressive vice, uh, the most impressive attorney general in the country, she then becomes a senator. She's following his path. So I'm very excited to hear what the Obamas are going to say, maybe particularly Michelle, because, I, you know, her podcast is all about becoming and about her, you know, her ability to embrace all aspects of what it meant to be the first um, black first lady and all of the challenges that she had dealing with that. So I'm excited to hear what they say. Look, we know Trump is going to say something, but I suspect that he's probably a little afraid of Kamala Harris. I don't think he'll know what to do about her. What name is he going to call her? Because any name you try, that's going to resonate with black people and Kanye West running third party won't fix it. There's nothing he can say about her. Anyone who wants to detract her based on anything is going to face a wall of black women like they've never seen. Biden just ensured that he will have maximum turnout from African-Americans. He just ensured that today. So I'm not really worried about her. And I think women in general are ready. Women's organizations organizations are all ready to mount up and defend her all the way to the finish line. And Joy, let's talk about two more constituencies who are likely having a big time of it right now. The uh, community of Howard University Bison scattered all over the country and the AKA Sorority yes. Sisters. 
Yeah, I think all the journalists who aren't sure what a ski we is, get to know it because you're going to see a lot of her, of the sororities. I think the whole Divine Nine. Look, if you're in a black fraternity or sorority, and remember, you know, the other, the one of the sister um, sororities, the Deltas, actually protested um, during the fight for suffrage because they were not allowed to march with the white women who were fighting for white women's suffrage. And so the, the sororities and the fraternities in this country go back 100 years. They go back a century to the early 20th century, the, the other bad old days in the first decades of the 20th century when these fraternities and sororities were fighting for inclusion of black people in American public life and doing so incredibly brave ways. So I expect the Divine Nine, every Every single black fraternity and sorority are very excited now, but yes, especially her own, the AKAs. And Howard University, listen, not only will she be the first black woman, but also the first AAPI woman. Let's not leave that out because, you know, she is also partly Asian American. And so she's the first Asian American woman vice presidential candidate, the first black woman vice presidential candidate, the first black vice presidential candidate, period, and the first Howard University alumni. And HBCU has sent a woman to the vice presidential ticket. That is big. That is a big deal. Joy Reid, thank you so much for being a part of our immediate reaction coverage. Uh, following the news we are all seeing on the screen, the name is Kamala Harris from the state of California. Mike Memley in Wilmington has some news to add to our conversation before we move on to a very important member of Congress. Mike? Brian, we talked uh, earlier about the activity we saw in downtown Wilmington, and indeed, the Biden campaign has now advised the first event in which we will see Joe Biden and Kamala Harris together. As the press release puts it, they will deliver remarks in Wilmington on working together to restore the soul of the nation and fight for working families to move the country forward. That grassroots fundraiser I mentioned as well is also likely to follow that. So this, this event tomorrow in downtown Wilmington will be the first time we see those two together, Brian. Our Mike Memley from his Delaware River Perch in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, thank you, Mike. Let's bring in the House Majority Whip, veteran Democratic Congressman Jim Clyburn of the state of South Carolina. As I've been saying during our coverage for months now, as personally responsible as any other individual uh, for the fact that we are talking about presumptive Democratic nominee Joe Biden. Congressman, you're very nice to join us. Your reaction to the naming of Kamala Harris to this ticket. Well, thank you very much for having me, Brian. I am ecstatic. Uh, as you know, I'm the father of three daughters. I have been saying what a plus it would be to have an African-American woman on the ticket. I just believe that we are breaking ground here uh, in such a way that every single a person in this country, irrespective of gender uh, or color, is going to be very proud with this country making this kind of a breakthrough. We are crashing through at a time that people are reaching out to each other, wanting to see this country live out its true creed, and this is a big, big step. And I think Joy is right. The whole divine nine, uh, you know, my sister, uh, sorority or deltas. Uh, but I am as proud of this as any other member of the African-American sorority and fraternity community. Okay. I'm from South Carolina State and HBCU. Uh, I'm a big uh, fan of HBCUs, but Howard has always been uh, a, a competitive for us at South Carolina State, but not this time. We are going to come together and we're going to run around this country. We're going to do what's necessary to get this ticket elected. I'm glad it wasn't me having to make this choice. There were great people to choose from, uh, but I think he has chosen well. Did you just break news that you're going to actually become a Bison fan? <laughs> well, uh, at least through November 3rd. But after that, I will go right back to my Bulldog country. Okay, that's fair. Uh, Congressman, <laughs> does this choice... Does this choice take care of any concerns you might have had about excitement, motivation, turnout? Absolutely. You know, I think people have been motivated for a long, long time. I think African Americans have been motivated. But I really believe this gives an extra shot in the arm. 
Uh, you know, I uh, have uh, really uh, worked hard uh, to make sure that our party is exclusive or inclusive of everything uh, that it can be inclusive of. And this demonstrates this old adage about Democrats taking black people for granted. This is another demonstration of the fact that ain't true. It never was true, but it's really it's dem demonstrative of the fact that it's not true. And then Joe Biden, just remember, he made the, uh, at, it was at my uh, endorsement. He said at that time that he was looking forward to putting an African-American woman on the Supreme Court. Uh, this could be a double whammy for us. And so I'm going to be running around saying to people, we've got a VP uh, choice on the ticket, and we know an African-American woman will be coming to the Supreme Court. That's a double reason for us to get to the polls uh, on the election day. So this is huge, and this is everything that we need uh, to incent people uh, to turn out the vote uh, come October 3rd. We want to start 30 days out. We aren't going to wait on November 3rd. November 3rd may be election day, but we are declaring election month this year, and we are dedicating this entire election year to my late friend, John R. Lewis. Understood. Congressman James Clyburn, South Carolina, as I said, and it bears repeating, as personally responsible as anyone in this country for the fact that the conversation we're having is about the choice of the presumptive nominee, Joe Biden. It was that night, that primary, that turned that campaign around. Congressman, good health. Thank you very much for uh, adding your voice to uh, the instant reaction we are getting to the naming of Kamala Harris, Senator from California. I believe Eugene Robinson is still available to us and of counsel to our coverage, the Pulitzer Prize winning columnist with the Washington Post. Eugene, I have uh, circled back around to you to get your mm -hmm. reaction in the moment to this news. And let me focus you on one question. Joe Biden said it would be someone um, with qualities he needed, didn't necessarily have. Mm -hmm. How does this fill in that blank, do you think? Well, that's not such an interesting question, Brian. I, I think um, it, she, she, uh, they both have the, the empathetic connection thing going for them. Um, uh, she is um, a woman of color. She is a, a black woman and Asian American woman. Um, and so thus makes history, but she has that different life experience that is particularly relevant at this moment, at this moment when the nation is seeking to grapple with centuries of systemic racism. Uh, and so for Joe Biden, who's going to inherit uh, this issue, and it's, and it's really been a crisis since the death of George Floyd, with protests continuing still uh, in cities around the country, uh, and polls showing that people really want to engage here and to, and to do something uh, about this original sin of, of this nation's formation that has never been expiated. Um, and, and so as, as Joe Biden, if he is elected, uh, comes to grapple uh, with the moment he will have at his side a woman with a very different lived experience um, who, who knows the issue, the issues of systemic racism from the other side. Uh, and so I think that'll be enormously valuable to him. Um, uh, you, you know, it, it is a it is a fascinating choice. I think it is the uh, it, it looks like the logical choice at the beginning of the process, and then there were detours this way and that way, and I think there were other good candidates in the end. Um, it was always said of, of Senator Harris that she ticked all the boxes, and I think she did, um, particularly the fact that she had, she did run for president. She did uh, uh, sit under the, the that massive glare of 
scrutiny that any presidential candidate does, and so she's she's been through that fire, um, and uh, and and thus won't be encountering it for the first time. Um, go back over her can her her campaign. She started with that amazing rally that you mentioned earlier, uh, and then followed it up with that haymaker that she landed on the chin of Joe Biden in that first debate. Then she didn't really have a follow up. And I, I, I think um, my reporting at the time told me that was maybe more due to the to her campaign than to her. Uh, but I think she became a a better and certainly more experienced campaigner on the national stage as the campaign went along. But by then, it had gone in a different direction, and it was not to be her as the presidential nominee. Um, so this is this is a second chance on the national stage for her, and I think. The, the first experience will have been uh, something of a crucible for her, and I think probably will have uh, will have given her a lot of experience uh, that will come in handy in the next few months. Um, uh, she also has a certain sort of fire uh, and passion and prosecutorial um, uh, bangs, if you want to um, describe them that way, um, that in a way Joe Biden doesn't doesn't have and I think that's that's another thing it's often the role of a vice presidential cam candidate is to be sort of uh, is to be on the attack uh, and she's very good at that I mean she's she is uh, she is a prosecutor's prosecutor and uh, so I think not just toward Mike Pence in that coming debate, but also toward President Trump and the entire administration. I think she will be a, a brutal critic uh, and, a, and, and probably an effective one. Uh, Eugene, uh, final question, because we're in a visual medium, uh, what does this do to the picture? It makes it look more like America. It really does. It makes it look more like the America that we are becoming uh, than uh, the other party, which looks more like the America uh, we once were or the America that many think we once were. And, and we, are, we are not as white a country. We are not um, as um, uh, hidebound and, um, uh, and straightened a country as, um, as the, the Republican Party, or at least its leadership, would would tend to to show. Um, so if you take a picture of the Republican ticket and a picture of the Democratic ticket, I think uh, I think you see uh, the past on the Republican side. I think you see something that looks more like the present and the future on the Democratic side. Um, uh, and you know, it'll be what we'll find out is is whether uh, Americans see it that way as well. As I always say at the conclusion of an interview with Eugene Robinson, that's why he has the Pulitzer Prize. Friend, thank you very much for your patience on stopping by today. Uh, before we head over to Princeton University, let's talk to the uh, normal occupant of this hour. Nicole Wallace has been able to phone into us to react to the naming of her fellow Californian. Nicole, uh, your off-the-cuff reaction. Well, I'll just share two pieces of information that I picked up in my reporting, one from the Biden side of the, you know, spectrum and one from the Trump side of the spectrum. I think that what this says about Joe Biden is a really good thing. There was no one tougher on him. If you remember those earliest debates when there were so many Democratic candidates for the nomination that they took up to stages. She was the toughest on him on what has become the issue at the at the beating heart of this country around questions of race. No one was tougher on him than her. And if there was a hurdle to this selection from people around him, it, it was just the uh, sharpness of those attacks. Then he picked her, said something really good about her and her courage at sort of being blunt and bringing important issues to the front before they were coursing through the national conversation at the pace with which they are now, and about him, knowing that he needed that. The other piece of reporting I picked up in the last week was from the Trump team, that from their viewpoint, because Donald Trump has no capacity to understand that this is the selection of a person to run the government, 
with the president. He only saw this in terms of a casting for the night of primetime coverage that is the vice presidential debate. And this was the pick that scared them the most. They thought that she would um, more than go tote. My dog and son are in the car. That's my dog barking. Sorry. Um, they thought she would more than go toe to toe with Pence. They thought she could chew him up and spit him out. And they pointed to her uh, cross-examination of one Bill Barr. So I think on both sides of the aisle, this says something really important about Biden's ability to pick the best person in his view. And it, it, it says something really interesting about how the Trump campaign, which I think it's now been reported, Donald Trump is already deep into his own debate prep. They view those debates as important, and they view her as starting with a real distinct advantage over Vice President Pence. Two things you mentioned are so important. Number one, the notes we saw from digital photography of Joe Biden's last press availability showed that he was prepared to talk about Kamala Harris during Q&A, uh, first among other topics. And one of the things we could discern from his handwriting was, and I'm paraphrasing, don't hold grudges, because it was so sharp a moment at that debate, uh, because this will, uh, at the end of the day, say something about his character and willingness to choose the right person. Um, that part of this, Nicole, is so interesting, along with what you raised. This is a, a woman, a, an attorney with a very sharp mind, a veteran cross-examiner who drew blood uh, against members of this government in live televised hearings. Look, well, she drew blood against vice former Vice President Biden, I mean, I don't know that there's a better debater or questioner on the political field right now. I mean, her skill set is unmatched in terms of being able to um, articulate an argument, sort of patiently wait to make her point, and look at the argument that the Democratic ticket has to make, that the tragedy that has gripped this country that will now prevent most of our kids from going back to school or from going back to school safely didn't have to be this tragedy. I mean, there is such a clear unifying case to be made against Donald Trump and especially against Vice President Pence. And Pence has that thing that Trump doesn't have. He, he can be made to display shame and her skills. And, and again, I think Biden picked her to help him run the country, to help him heal the country, to help him fix the country. I don't think, have any reporting that suggests that he selected her for the purposes of that debate. But in terms of the psychological impact on the other side, I think they are regroup, regrouping right now and, and probably already trying to figure out how to challenge her. And she's not just going to be making the argument against Pence. She's going to be making the argument against Donald Trump every single day between now and Election Day. And that is a seismic advantage for the Biden-Harris ticket. To our viewers, that is the best reporting from a moving car with son and dog <laughs> on board that you will ever hear from uh, the normal host of this two-hour period. Uh, Nicole Wallace, thank you, friend, for uh, calling in and reacting in real time uh, and with such precision to this news. I promised there. we thank would stop you. in. Okay. Thank you. I promised we would stop into Princeton University along the way. Professor Eddie Glaude Jr. has been kind enough to hang out with us. He heard the news in real time. He's ready to react uh, to real time. Professor, what do you make of the selection? This is savvy political political poli I mean political calculus. I think he's doing a couple of things simultaneously. One, he's exciting the base. Uh, there was this sense that people were going to, they were more motivated to get Donald Trump out of office than they were about the Biden candidacy. Now we have a tandem. You're going to have the base excited. The turnout is going to even be even higher now. And now uh, you heard that in, in, in Representative Clyburn's voice. You heard it in Joy Reid's voice. I think you're going to hear it around the country. That's the first thing. The second thing, I think he, he, he moves the chess piece in an interesting sort of way. We've been hearing from Donald Trump and his surrogates that Biden was beholden to the radical left. I don't know if that 
works with Kamala Harris on the ticket. But it does raise, raise questions, and this is something that I'm interested in, about how will, how will the left respond to this pick? I want to hear what Bernie Sanders is thinking. I want to hear what AOC is thinking. I want to hear what Elizabeth Warren's thinking. But more importantly, I want to hear what black activists on the ground who, who know uh, Kamala Harris's record as AG, what they're thinking. So we see this interesting moment here that is really, really wise. And then the third move, I want to say this very clearly. We knew, uh, Brian, that this election was the most important election in our lifetime. We knew that it was a choice, a momentous choice. Now it is a stark choice between two Americas, an old America, as, as, as Eugene said, and a new America. The reckoning is now clearly in November at the ballot box, and it is represented symbolically and now we need to see it represented at the level of policy. This is an extraordinary political moment for us, and I'm, I'm really excited to see what comes. So just when you thought it couldn't be in more stark relief, uh, in your view, the choice just got more stark. Exactly. Exactly. All I right. mean, look, you have... Uh, you have... Biden, and you have Kamala Harris. You have Donald Trump, and you have Mike Pence. What a choice for the country to make. Professor Eddie Glaude, Jr., uh, in his library in Princeton, uh, thank you, sir, uh, especially for hanging out with us uh, to react to this news. Uh, we bring in another friend of this broadcast, Alicia Menendez. Uh, Alicia, your reaction to the news? Uh, it, obviously historic, as so many people have said, also so incredible to watch all of the other women who had been in, encouraged, consider for this role, begin to react to the news. You had Stacey Abrams saying that she is thrilled to support Kamala Harris, Susan Rice calling Kamala Harris tenacious, trailblazing. I've been speaking to a lot of the organizers who have been pushing for Kamala Harris, and so much of them remind us that a lot of this is about Kamala Harris, about her campaign, about her team, but also not to be underestimated, the organizing forces that went into really laying the groundwork and demanding that Joe Biden and his campaign consider not only a woman of color, but a black woman. And so there are a lot of people today who are celebrating that effort and also saying that effort is a model should Joe Biden be elected to continue to hold Biden and Kamala Harris, his running mate, should they win, accountable once they are in office. But you know, Brian, I also think that there are bigger lessons that we have learned from watching this process play out. Among them, you know, once you had Biden out there saying that he was absolutely going to choose a woman um, and that question was taken off the table, what revealed itself was how deep this democratic bench of women is, how much talent there is, the fact that they are ready, willing, and able, and that for the first time, they weren't doing what we've seen other candidates do before where they demurred and said, well, I'll leave it to someone else. You had a lot of women, a lot of women of color, making the case for why they were the best candidate. And that sends an incredible message to women across this country, to girls across this country, that you can show up for yourself, advocate for yourself, and at the end of the day, uh, cross the finish line. Wow, well put. Alicia Menendez, thank you for being part of our coverage and our rapid reaction force following this news. Let's add one more name to the list, and that is veteran author, presidential historian, Michael Beschloss. Michael, as uh, with every day, I've been following your social media, which has you've been putting out photos of uh, uh, vice presidential picks we have known and in some cases loved how other presidents, how other nominees have handled the process. The great warning of modern time was the McGovern Eagleton combination after the revelations, how short lived that was not even three weeks. Your assessment of today's choice, and go ahead and boldly predict how history may view today's choice. Well, I think I have to predict that, Brian, because I think our children and grandchildren will be talking about this and learning about this day for a long time. It's an historic day. You know, look at all those vice presidents in history. Zero women, 
zero African Americans, zero Asian Americans, uh, only one traditional practicing Catholic, and that's Joe Biden. This recognizes the glorious diversity of America. In these times when we've got a president who treats immigrants with contempt, this is a nation of immigrants, as John Kennedy put it. She is the daughter of a Jamaican immigrant and an Indian immigrant. You know, what better symbol than that? This is a person whose entire career has been defending the rule of law. Now she's the vice presidential nominee to be at a time that the rule of law is under grave challenge by a president and a, an attorney general. She's always been for limiting presidential power. And we're in a time when a president has been trying to expand presidential power in dangerous ways. And one other thing not as important is what I've said, Brian, can you believe she was, this is gonna make us all feel old. She was born two weeks before Kamala Harris was, two weeks before Lyndon Johnson was elected in 1964. And even that has some poetry because as you and I have discussed, you can hear it on the Johnson tapes, 1968, Hubert Humphrey was dominated by the Democrats. LBJ called up Humphrey and said, I think you should choose as vice president Daniel Inouye of Hawaii, an Asian American and of Japanese descent. Humphrey thought about it, but said for 1968, that was a bridge too far. Look at how far we've come. What a wonderful day. Uh, similarly, when he called LBJ to uh, say, I'm, I'm going to choose Ed Muskie, there's an almost identifiable uh, letdown in Johnson's energy as he took in the news, but asked Hubert Humphrey, well, if you've talked to him, if you've prayed on it, walked around, thought about it, if he's your choice, he's your choice. Uh, Michael, because we're in a um, visual medium, looking at the books on your shelves, the, the coin of the historian's realm is mostly black and white photographs. This right. changes the picture. It's just like Barack Obama would talk about in 2008. Yes, if I'm elected, those, you know, those placemats that kids have, my kids have these placemats. I'll bet you that yours, yours had them too, Brian, you know, with the pictures of presidents in history. And Barack Obama said, you know, things like that will be different from now on. We'll look at this in a different way. This is long overdue. I mean, this is, you know, we're in 2020. 100 years ago was the year that uh, um, women in America were guaranteed the right to vote. White women, as it turns out, because African-American women were largely kept from voting. And it's been this long for this to happen. This is the way the system, in my view, is supposed to work.